Hallelujah. Good morning, good night, good afternoon, good evening. God, my face is shining like the sun out there. <laughs> uh, how are you all doing? I hope that you all are well. I hope that you all are blessed. I pray that um, you all have been listening, taking notes, reading, rereading, going over, studying, praying, talking to God and um, growing in faith, growing in righteousness and righteous deeds, um, and so forth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenths. We are in this ongoing study, the 10 words, the 10 matters, the 10 things, the 10 laws, the 10 commandments. And we are closing in. We are, we are getting there to the end. <laughs> I must say, um, it's been a long, a very, very challenging path. Um, some, some, some words or some instructions uh, went on a little bit more than we expected, but that's those are the things that we we we've come to know and acknowledge that when God's involved, you know you come prepared as you may, um, and things don't always turn out the way you want it to, but it always turns out the way it's supposed to turn out. Amen, because God is in control. We are we we have. Uh, gone over the 10 words up to last week we did uh, thou shalt not commit adultery and we talked about that at length um, I think last the last session was like two hours thereabouts we we always try to culminate at about an hour and a half um, you know we don't want to make it too short uh, but at the same time, we, we don't want to make it too long. Sometimes it's inevitable. We just It just happens that way, right? But it's not planned. Um, it's something that we are cognizant of. But like, as I said, the other thing that I'm even more cognizant of is <laughs> this is God. And this is, this is, this is his thing. So I just, I just try to stay in the water and... <laughs> Let the current push me where it may. Um, th this morning we are back in Exodus 20. Get your Bibles. Open it to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to do some more reading today. <laughs> Last week we did we did quite a bit of reading. And we 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 we, cro we crossed quite a quite a bit of revelation. Um you know. Uh, we, we saw quite a bit of things. This week, um, we'll, we'll just do the same, right? Um, we are in the book of Exodus, and we are down to chapter 50, sorry, 20th chapter of Exodus. We are in verse 15. Exodus 20, verse 15. In the study the 10 words, right? Just to reiterate, these are not my 10 words. These are not your 10 words. These are not your parents' 10 words. Not your grandfather, your, your grandpa, your, grand, your grandma. This, this, these 10 words have nothing to do with you. According to the written testimony in the biblical narrative, Moses received these 10 words that were written by the finger of God on two tablets of stone. <laughs> okay? Yes, Moses received them, but Moses didn't write them. Even the second, even after he broke the first two tablets, he was, to, he was instructed, now you go and you cut two fresh tablets and you bring them to me. I will rewrite them. 
This is his written testimony. Right? God, with his own finger, wrote these words down. And if that don't scare you, if that don't, uh, uh, what's what I'm trying to say? If that doesn't grab your attention, then nothing else I say will. The man who was attributed, who was given the credence, who was given the acknowledgement of writing the five books called the five books of Moses, Genesis, uh, uh, Exodus, uh, um, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I don't know if I get the order right, but it, that's not important. Those first five books. The man that was ascribed, the man that was given the credence, the, the acknowledgement of having written those five books, he himself said, them 10, I didn't write that. Those were written by the finger of God and was given to me. <laughs> okay? And in this chapter that we, are, we have been in for the past few weeks, Verse 1 explicitly said, God spoke all these words saying. So the writer of the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus is saying, God spoke these words. <laughs> right? And that's where we are. God spoke these words saying again if that doesn't grab your attention uh then you could just switch that off and and go about your business and among these words that god spoke saying is this word thou shalt not steal Thou shall not steal. You'll be like, well, I, I never steal nothing. That's a lie. I'm sure you have taken pens and pencils and paraphernalia and different things from your job. I'm sure you 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 you've um I'm sure you've picked something up that doesn't belong to you and and and, and kept it. For whatever the reason. Okay? Again, this is not a message to condemn. This is not a message to put down. This is not a message to destroy. This is a message about bringing into focus the idea that none of us are perfect. When God made us, we were not perfect. Even though he said that we are good. God knew exactly what he created. If we go back into Genesis and we dig and we research the word Adam, right? That word for human being in Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28, we will find that wrapped up in that word is some things that's not nice, okay? And God knew. He knew that he created this being with flaws. He knew that. And in knowing that, he still said, after all was said and done, he, God looked at it and saw that it was all very good. And that might sound like an oxymoron. How could you say, sir, that God made something that was flawed, but then he still 
looked at the flawed thing and called it good. Well, that's what, that's what it was. <laughs> it's not me saying it. It's what it was. Okay? It is what it is. That doesn't mean that because you know that you're flawed, that that gives you a right to just go do whatever. See, Paul understood that premise because let's go there as a matter of fact. Let's go to the new, the renewed covenant, the book of Romans, the ninth chapter. Let's read some things. Okay? Let's read some things. Let's read from chapter one. That's not where we, we not where I'm trying to go. We're going to get where I want to go, but let's start at verse one. Romans nine, verse one says these words. This is Paul, the apostle, making an exclamation. I tell you the truth in Mashiach, in Messiah, in Christ. Paul is being very adamant here that he is telling the truth. Right? I am not lying, he goes on to say, and includes my conscience bears witness or my conscience is testifying to me with the Holy Spirit. So if we, if we look at that verse, if we look at the words, which what this whole lesson is about, is about the words. Specifically, the 10 words but includes words as a whole. And Paul is making the emphatic statement that he's not lying. He's telling the truth. He's calling on God, the man Yeshua. He's calling on the witness of the spirit to let everybody who is hearing know I'm putting myself in a place of judgment just so that you would understand that I am telling the truth. He goes on in verse 2. That I have great sorrow and unceasing pain in my heart. I don't know about you. I don't know how you think, or what you think. I don't know how you feel and what you feel. But I pay attention to, to words, especially the written word. And deep inside of Paul's heart, I hear a cry. I hear... A shout, I hear a burden, I hear grief about something that he knows. And he's trying to express that to us. I ask that we pay heed. I ask that we listen intently. I ask that we listen to these words with that in mind. He says, verse 3, and this, this, these, these next few words are some of the most diabolical words that somebody could speak about themselves. That, that somebody could wish on themselves. These words. And you may have read them. You, you, may, you may have heard them being read. Maybe, perhaps, I, I hope, I pray 
And, and, and furthermore, I hope I pray that you would hear them even more, even from a greater depth as what I'm getting ready to say. He says in verse three, listen, for I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ or from Messiah for my brother's sake. Again, I want us to pay attention to words. From the get-go, the apostle here is speaking from the depth of his heart. He is crying out from the depth of his grief, his sorrow, the burden that he is feeling to let the readers, to let the hearers, to let the people know that he's telling the truth. And from the core depth of his spirit, he uttered these words. I wish that I myself were accursed from the Messiah for my brother's sake. Now let's break that down. Remember the topic of today's session is thou shall not steal. And if you tell a lie, if I teach a lie, if I preach a lie, what I am doing is stealing. I am stealing your faith. I am stealing your attention. I am stealing your emotion. I am stealing your, your, your sense of Knowing I am stealing from you. If I preach or teach a lie. As a matter of fact. Anybody. Who lies. Who tell lies. They are stealing. And the command According to Exodus 20 and 15 is thou shalt not steal. So this becomes of tantamount importance when it comes to Paul and what he's trying to say. And what he is saying here is so diabolical. Just, uh, just to his own well-being. Because he's saying that he wished that he was cut off or accursed from the Messiah. Do you understand the, the, the ferocity of that statement? Do you understand the detriment of what he just said? Do you understand the implications? Do you really understand do you perceive do you see the burden i wish that i was accursed from the messiah this man claims that he was so much in love with god that he was such a fanatic when it come or when it came to the word of God, that he was literally persecuting people who had the same claim. The people who claim they love God, the people who claim that they were following God. <laughs> this man, this is the man we're talking about. This man claims that because of the passion, because of the fervency, because of the, 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 the absolute fanatical nature of his love for God, that he ended up encountering God. 
As a matter of fact, the words revealed in his encounter were these. Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? The King James says, why are you kicking against the pricks? Do you even, have you even thought about that? Have you even thought about the fact that, you know what a prick is? It's like a thorn, okay? Can you imagine yourself, barefooted or not, walking up to a tree, a tree that has prongs on it, thorns on it, a tree that has pricks on it, and you going at the tree, kicking at it, literally bringing your foot in contact with, to, to, to the thorns or the pricks. Imagine it in your head, if you will. Imagine it in your imagination, if you will. See it in your spirit. And Paul himself says that these were the words that Yeshua used. <laughs> Paul, why are you kicking against the pricks? You are hurting your own self. You are bringing damage to your cause. You are fighting against something that you cannot win. Please, people, hear the Spirit of God today. Please, the people of God, hear the cry of the heart of the Father. What in God's green earth could a man, what in God's green earth could drive a man who is completely and fanatically and emphatically believing in the God of creation, what in God's green earth could drive that man to say, I wish that I myself would be cut off from the Messiah. Why? What are you seeing, sir? What are you feeling, sir, ma'am? What, what is it that causes you to wish to be cut off from your Savior? That is not a rational thought. That is not a, 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 that is not a thought to be entertained because Paul is talking about life and death. He's talking about condemnation and damnation. He is talking about separation from the God that he is believing in, that he is thrusted himself into. He is going against everything that he himself, himself hold fast to. You have to understand this. And what was it? What was it that he is sensing? What was it that he is seeing? What is it that he is honing into that could drive him to this? The cause is, brothers and sisters, for our sakes, for the sake of the brethren, that he was so moved with, with compassion. He was so moved with passion. He was so moved with, with uh, uh, a fear. He was so moved by, by what he knew that it, it compelled him to speak in these terms. And in this, Paul goes on to explain some 
certain things about God. But what I want to bring us to that draw us here are these words. So I'm going to skip down. He said, What shall we say then? And I know I'm, I'm, I'm skipping down here because I want to get to, 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 to what, he, what he spoke about when it comes to the idea about what God created in us. How he created us. And how God, even knowing what he created, is, was completely satisfied with his creation. Knowing that what he created was in fact flawed. He knew it. He knew that in us was this potential, was this ability to fall. To sin, to steal, if you will, to lie, to cheat, to murder, to worship idols. He knew it. And that, knowing that, did not deter him from looking at what he created and calling it very good. And as I said before, we ought not, after getting that understanding, we ought not now to say, well, if God know what he created, then I could just do whatever I want and, and God shouldn't be upset. <laughs> which is where we are going, which is what even Paul himself is alluding to in Romans 9. And so verse 14 says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is God an unrighteous God? Is God a wicked, evil person? Is he a wicked, evil spirit? Does he not care? Does he do things vicariously? And Paul says, may it never be. And he goes on to explain in Romans 9 and 15. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who has mercy. Okay? Verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, remember that story, for this very purpose, I caused you to be raised up that I might show in you my power, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Okay, hold on. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens, whom he desires. And so Paul comes back into this idea that because God knows what he created in mankind, he 
because God knew what he created and still had the, uh, uh, pardon my uh, uh, word here, audacity to call what he created very good, then that thing that he created that now realizes that God knew I was flawed from the beginning. So then if God knew that I'm flawed, then God ought not to be upset when I am flawed or when I act on my flawedness, if that's a word, or when I act on my faultiness, if that's a word, or when I act out in my flaws. God is, he shouldn't get mad. He should just accept the fact that's what he created. <laughs> See, but then Paul comes back and says these, these words. Verse 90. You will say then to me. Why does he still find fault? Why does God still find fault with us? Even though God knew that he created us faulty. If God knows that he created us with flaws, why is he yet upset when we act out in those flaws? And Paul responds <laughs> to that Ironic question. He responds to that rhetoric. He says, But indeed, verse 20, he says, But indeed, O man, listen, he says, But indeed, O man, whom are you? Who are you to talk back to God? Who are you, man, to talk back to God? Will the thing that was formed, will the thing that was created, ask the thing who created it, why did you create me like this? <laughs> I, I am very adamant and very insistent in these things that we have not been reading these words the way we ought to have been reading them. I, I sincerely believe that partly because of the way we were raised, partly because of the things we were taught. And when I say raised, I mean in, 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 the, in the body of Christ, in the church per se, the things we were taught through doctrine and, 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 and so on. I, part, I believe that partly because of those ways, because of those teachings, that we read scripture the way we read it. Because we read scripture with an, with an already set interpretation. We read the scripture, having been taught the scripture, when we read it, we read it in the interpretation that we have been taught. We don't read the scripture verbatim. We don't read the scripture and take it for what it says. See, when we read Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let us give him dominion over the fish of the sea, and you know, yada, yada, yada. 
And I don't know if you, you, you knew, but there's that saying, yada, yada, yada. Yada is a Hebraic word, meaning you know, <laughs> or do know. So when you hear somebody say, yada, 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 it simply means, you know, uh, and you know the story, you know how it goes. You understand? You feel me? <laughs> you see? All those things. That's what the word yada means. So he says, and, and, as, I, and I, as I said, as a matter of fact, let's not take my word for it. Let's go read, right? It's, it's right here. It's in the book. you there, right? You have your Bible open, right? If we go read Genesis, right? One, that's where we're going. And 26, and God said, let us make man. And the, that word man, it's strong, strong number, the strong concordance, it's, it's number 120. Okay, and that word, according to the Brown's Driver Briggs definition, right, it means man or mankind. So technically, it's not the name of the man. <laughs> it's a description of the thing that God created. Oh boy, somebody's, I hope somebody believe in me. Technically, when God said, let us make man, he's not calling Adam. He's describing what he's getting ready, what he's thinking about making. <laughs> and according to BDB, The definition is man, mankind. It's a human being. Okay? They will go on and say it's the first man, the first human being. Interesting thing is that word comes from another word. What's the title? What's the title of the series? The Ten Words. And remember, I said, if I teach you a lie, I'm stealing. And in this word, we are dealing with the command, thou shalt not steal. So I don't want to steal from you. This word. The Hebrew word in the Strong's lexi in the Strong's concordance, the word, the number ascribed to it is one twenty. The word is Adam. Has a root, and the root is one nineteen. The number that you go back and look at for the root of that word is. The number 119. 119 comes just before 120. So, let's look at that word. Okay? And that word, Adam, it, it, it sounds phonetically, it sounds the same, kind of phonetically. And the definition is, to be read. Listen to that very carefully. To be read. Okay? Or read. Okay? Is, is there another person in the Bible that has that redness about them, but is not called Adam? Hmm. To be rubbed red, to be dyed red, to redden, to cause to show red, to glare, 
Listen, people. Listen to the interesting ideals and ideas that come out, that emanate from this word. Adam, the human being. To redden, to grow red, to look red. And the Strong's definition explicitly says to show blood in the face. That is to be flush, to turn rosy, be dyed, be made red, ruddy. <laughs> Do you know, and I'm just say this and then we'll go back to 120. Do you know that anger is symbolic to turning red, to being red, to glare. All these are synonymic synonyms to the word anger. Because when people get angry, their, their blood gets the face, the blood get in the face. And it says here to, to, to emit redness, right? To show red. And another word that we can be familiar with that describes that, that we are talking about is the word blush. <laughs> oh gosh. You got to love God. I'm telling you, man. It's the blush. So when a guy or a girl sees a guy or a girl, and I mean that in the strictest form, in other words, when a guy sees a girl or if a girl sees a guy, the propensity to blush comes from the idea that the guy sees this girl whom he feels something to what? In a romantic, in a normal, natural, God-built kind of way. He blushes. <laughs> His face. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I get it. And vice versa. If a girl sees a guy and there's some kind of, you know, what, what the world calls chemistry, there's some kind of attraction, the girl also has that same tendency to blush. <laughs> so it's anger. It's not a girl thing or a guy thing. It's not a male thing or a female thing. It's a human thing I, I i hope somebody's hearing me so it's 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 a, it's a line in a letter that we've been repeatedly saying in this in these programs paul says be angry but sin not you <laughs> be angry but sin not. And what I'm saying to you is God, who said, let us make man, knew that man, because of what he was making, man had the propensity to become angry. And this is all in creation, this is before the fall. This is before what we know as sin. This is before that. This is in the culmination of God creating the man, the human being. Now, when we go back to Adam, Word number 120 in the Strong's Concordance, the Hebrew word number 120, this is what we see. We see this 
redness in face, this showing blood, we see this, it becomes even a little more prominent. S Strong's says that 120 is ruddy. That is a human being, an individual or the species, mankind, it means, and it could also mean another human being. And, and Strong's added these little things. Hypocrite. Common sort. It's like a commoner. Strong's added low. A low man or a man of low degree. Right? Now, I, I'm just saying in the creation, if this is what is described as what God is getting ready to create, and he in fact did create that, and he knows all things, then God knows exactly what he created. Yet still, according to Genesis 1 and 31, and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good did you did, did you see that god said the writer of the book of genesis who is ascribed as moses said God saw, he perceived, he knew, he understood, he comprehended everything that he created and he and behold, it was very good very good is the description according to the biblical narrative in Genesis 1 and 31 so having said that let's go back to what Paul said In Romans 9, Paul says, ah, hold on, I'm trying to get a different version. Paul says in Romans 9, not one, Romans 9, boy, yes. I was like, why am I, why does this doesn't sound familiar? Paul says in Romans 9. But indeed, 9 and, 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 and 20. But indeed, O oh man, who are you to talk back or to reply against God? Who are you to question God? Who are you? To, to say, well, what? God, are you got to be nuts. You made me like this, and now, and then you, you, you get mad when I act a certain way? Paul says, 
we have no right to even think like that. And then he goes on to say, will the thing formed ask the thing, will the thing formed ask him who formed it? Why did you make me like this? And I, I, and, and I know I've said this many times in prior, t prior sessions, but I, it bears repeating itself. It bears me saying this again. Simply because it's true. And I didn't come to steal from you. Because human beings are the only entity in creation who speak, who use words. We are the only entity in creation who rebel, if you will. And I say this cautiously because I know animals make noises and so on and so on. And scientists will fight and say, well, you know, animals rebel. They will, you know, they will do things that will show their non-compliance with measures that we may take. And I get that, but I'm, I'm talking about human beings. From the perspective of the, 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 the greatest of all of God's creation, the, the ones with all the intellect, the ones with all the, the perception, with all the knowledge, the ones with all the capacity to be like God. Right? We are the only ones who rebel. The trees don't rebel. You don't see a tree planted and rebels. Like for instance, you plant an orange tree. The orange tree don't rebel and give you grapes. You plant an avocado tree. The avocado tree don't rebel and reproduce plums you plant a grapefruit tree the grapefruit tree don't rebel and produce apples it never happens it never the, does the earth doesn't rebel against its core principle of why it was created the winds the rains, those things don't rebel. Even the animals, to, to a certain degree, don't rebel against create the creator. The animals rebel against the creation, against things like us. You mistreat the animal, the animal is probably going to rebel against you. The animal doesn't rebel against God its creator. We are the only ones with voices who will be like, God, what the world you did? Like, we, you know, like we, the, like, you know what I'm saying? Like we something. You see what I'm saying? We will talk back to God. We are going to go toe to toe with God. We are the ones, we are the only ones who somewhere can decide, oh, oh, oh you want me to do this? No, I ain't doing that. Mm -mm, I gotta live, I gotta eat. I could steal, I could sell drugs, why not? I could kill, why not? I could commit adultery, why not? I gotta live, I gotta do what I think I gotta do. To survive, you know? We are the only ones in all of creation. The human beings. <laughs> Let's go back to Exodus 20.
thou shalt not steal. And again I say to you, if I am not teaching truth, if I'm not, if I'm not telling you what thus saith the word of God, then I'm lying to you. And if I'm lying to you, I'm stealing from you. You know, I've said this again before, many times. I used to work with police officers, right? No, I was not a police officer, but I used to work with them. And, 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 and something that you learn being a, with a police officer is, you will hear this, that the, the police officers have a, a, a psychology of thinking, a way of thinking that says, if, if, if a thief can be a murderer, it's easy for somebody who steals to become a murderer. It's easy. It's easy for somebody who lies to steal. As I have just said, anybody who lies is stealing. I know maybe perhaps you never heard it like that. And maybe perhaps you never heard it being explained like that. But that's the truth. When you lie, you're actually stealing. You know, I, I remember um, the movie Deliver Us From Eva. Right? Deliver Us from Eva. Write it down. Go see it. In the movie. It's a it's an awesome movie. I love it. That's one of my favorite uh, movies of all time. Right? Um, and there's, there's this role play between um, uh, LL Cool J. Who's uh, uh, one character. And Gabrielle Union. Who plays another character. And they're supposed to be you know, liking each other. But the, the truth is that the beginning of the relationship, LL Cool J was like a was like a paid assassin. He was paid to create the semblance of love towards his, his female uh, com, com, counterpart, Gabriel Union. They show that in the movie. The brothers-in-law, because of how she was, they wanted her out the way. And so they asked sweet boy LL Cool J, can he come in? Can he meet the sister? Can he bamboozle her with his charm and his wit and all that stuff and can he steal her heart and kind of draw her out of the relationship that she had with her two sisters ladies and gentlemen it was all a lie suffice it to say in the movie Every lie will be demolished. You cannot build. Let me, let me rephrase that, that sentence. You should not build on a lie. If you build on a lie. And. You, you, you. In the lie. You. Come to the point where you realize, I got to come clean. I got to make it right. The first thing that you have to do is destroy that lie. That's the first thing. You got to break that lie. You got to kill that lie. You got to destroy that bad foundation that you built. And sometimes in destroying that foundation... Whatever you may have built with that gets destroyed. So
So you gotta be careful. You have to be careful. Okay? In how you build something. You remember, if you lie, you steal. Because in the movie, when Gabrielle Union found out, that when her character found out that her feelings were, were she didn't know, she didn't see the lie. So as far as she knew, she was standing on good foundation. But when she realized that it was all a lie, even though at the time he, had, he broke down his original lie and was coming clean to now speak the truth that he did in fact really and truly did love her. She accused him of stealing. See? She accused him of stealing from her because he painted one picture and she bought into that, but that picture was a lie. So he stole from her. Listen, I didn't come here to steal. Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. No one goes to God except through the word. Yeah, I know we've been taught that, that, that Jesus is everything and you ought to go through Jesus. Well, he is the word. Everything we read in the biblical na, pa, na, pa, uh, passages, it's who he represents, it's what he is. John says, he is the word and the word became flesh. He is God. So when Jesus in John 14 or 15 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he knows exactly what he's saying. He's not lying to us. He's not stealing from us. He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I came to give. I didn't come to steal. I did not come to ask for any favors. I am the favor. I am the bread of life. You take of me. Eat me. I came to be eaten. I did not come to eat. I am him who are to be who is to be eaten. See, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I didn't come to steal, to kill, or to destroy. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So when we talk about thou shall not steal, we have to see the veracity of what that means in its entirety. Exodus 21, 16. Let's go there. Just down the street. Next chapter over. Is it Exodus? Sorry. Oh, man. 
Hold on, hold on one second. Ah, uh, shall not steal. Yeah, Exodus twenty one sixteen. Let's let's go right next next chapter. Interestingly, it says, we just read, thou shalt not steal. Let's read Exodus 21, 16, and let's see what it says. Anyone who kidnaps someone and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps someone and sells him. Kidnapping is stealing. It's a different word, but it is stealing. Leviticus 6 and 1. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. We're going to read. We're going to read 6. Leviticus 6. Jehovah spoke to Moses. You got to keep up now. Jehovah spoke to Moses saying. Listen to this. If anyone sins. And commits a trespass against Jehovah. And deals falsely with his neighbor in a matter of deposit or of bargain or of robbery or has oppressed his neighbor <laughs> or has found that which was lost and lied about it and swearing to a lie. In any of these things that a man sins in his actions, then it shall be if he has sinned and is guilty, he shall restore that which he took by robbery or the thing which he had gotten by oppression or the deposit with which was committed to him or the lost thing which he found, or anything about which he has fa sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and shall add a fifth part more to it. He shall return it to whom it belongs in the day of his being found guilty. He shall bring a trespass offering to Jehovah, a ram without defect from the flock, according to your estimation, for a trespass offering to the priest. The priest shall make atonement for him before Jehovah, and he will be forgiven concerning whatever he does to become guilty. That's a mouthful there. But I want us to, to, to listen. I want us to hear. I want us to hear. If a man commits, if, if a man sins, I want us to hear. I want us to hear who the man is really sinning against. If a man sins and commits a trespass, same word, same meaning, different word, like a synonym, against Jehovah. Okay? If a man sins and commits a trespass against Jehovah, against God, Listen to, I want you to hear the categories now. And deals falsely with his neighbor in a matter of a deposit. 
deals falsely with his neighbor in a matter of a deposit ha, could have a variety of applications. Okay? You dealing falsely with your neighbor it have a variety of applications. So it don't have to be stealing. It, uh, it don't have to be money. It, it's a variety of applications. Or of bargain. Again, a plethora of applications. Or of robbery. Again, a plethora of applications. And let me say, say this also. That all these words are synonyms. Okay? They are words incorporating the same actions, the same dealings, the same kind of lies and falsities and so on and such. Here's the last one. Or has oppressed his neighbor. Oppressed. What? Oppressed? What is... See, <laughs> how is oppressing your neighbor, how does that transform itself into a lie and that transform itself into stealing? Think about it. Okay? Think about it. It's all wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in the same thing. Let's go back. We're reading, okay? We're doing a lot of reading. Leviticus 19, 11. And interesting, Exodus is not known to be a book of the Torah, a book of the laws, right? But there's some instructions in there, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, what did I say? Leviticus 19 and 11. Let's go to Leviticus 19 and 11. Leviticus is known as the book of the laws, right? Leviticus, why I keep messing up. Is Leviticus 19 and 11, not the other way around. Maxi, come on, get it together, son. <laughs> Interesting here. You all there? Okay, let's read. Here, in Leviticus 19 and 11, it says... You shall not steal, you shall not lie, you shall not deceive one another. <laughs> Again, why, why does the writer in this sentence lump all these three together? You shall not steal, you shall not lie, you shall not deceive one another. I say to you, it's because all of those things are wrapped up and tied up and tangled up in the same entity. You could call it stealing, you could call it lying, you could call it deceiving. It's all one and the same. So don't steal will mean don't lie. Don't lie will mean don't deceive. Because if you do any one of those three, you might have done all three. You will have done all three. It is, this. I'm just saying. Let's go back. Leviticus 19.35.
Wait. Did I say 19 and 35? Leviticus 19. Yeah. 35. That's what it says. Oh. Leviticus 19. Yes. 35. <laughs> oh God, listen here, man. You, I don't know how you could think you could outsmart God. I really don't. I just want to read this, right? It, it's 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 a little bit a little bit more than what we getting into, what we into. But I, I just want to read it because of how it sounds. It's awesome. Leviticus 19 and 33 says these words. If a stranger lives as a foreigner with you in your hand, you shall do him no wrong. <laughs> oh boy. Listen, man. God is something else. The stranger, this is verse 33. And going into verse 34. The stranger who lives as a foreigner with you shall be to you as a native born among you. And you shall love him as yourself. Oh, please, Father, help me. Did you hear that? For you lived as foreigners in the land of Egypt. See, again, this is this is like a side note, right? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yeshua says this way. Love your enemies and pray for those who willfully persecute you and do you wrong. Love your enemies. Jesus said that. So, how many of us can say we love our enemies? I see him over there. I know he's my enemy because he's kicking up fuss. He's complaining. He's doing all kinds of things about me. He is my enemy. I know that. Yet, yeah. I hate him. I hate everything about him. I hate his guts. Why do I hate him? Because he's my enemy. Because he's my enemy. Yet Jesus says, Jesus, the same Jesus who we believe in, the same Jesus who we hold fast to, the same Jesus who says, who we say came and died. That same Jesus says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Bless those who ridicule you and persecute you for my name's sake. Bless them, he says. Oh, gosh. Getting a headache. This is, this is too immaculate. I'll read those two passages again. If a stranger lives as a foreigner with you in your hand, in your land, sorry, you shall not do him wrong. If a stranger who lives as a foreigner with you 
you shall do, you shall be to, he shall be to you as a native born among you. That's crazy. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am Jehovah. Don't steal. And then he says, and this is the part we get to, you shall do no right unrighteousness. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in measure of length or of weight or of quantity. You shall do no unrighteousness. Even if the person is your enemy, your sworn enemy, they know you're their enemy, you know they're your enemy. You shall do no unrighteous judgment in measures of length, of weight, or of quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights, Adjust ever, adjust him. I am Jehovah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have observed to do all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them. I am Jehovah. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in measure of length or of weight or of quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights and just effort and adjust him. I am Jehovah your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. No, he didn't say that. There. I'm just saying that. You shall observe all of my statutes and all of my ordinances and do them. I am Jehovah. It's a, it's a strange thing. It's a good, sweet, but strange thing because he's here talking about being just, just in your measures of length, in your measures of weight, and in your measures of quantity, right? Because if you don't, if you're not just, you're unjust. And if you're unjust, you're stealing. And if you're stealing, you're lying. And if you're lying, you're stealing. Oh my goodness. Oh. Exodus 20. I just was there. I moved it too fast. Are we there? We're gonna do one more. Fifteen, thou shalt not steal. Okay. <laughs> Where you all want to go? You all want to go to New, New Testament? Really? Let's go there. Matthew 15. Let's go Matthew 15. <laughs> That's a good one. This is a good one. This is a really good one. Matthew 15. Go on. I keep going to, to first, but you 15, bam, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, 
Oh gosh. Are you ready? Matthew 15. We'll close. We'll wrap it up after here. Okay. Matthew, we'll start at verse 1. It reads as follows. Matthew 15 and 1 reads as follows. Then the Pharisees and the scribes, then the pastors and the apostles and the, the, the evangelists and the teachers came to Yeshua from Jerusalem saying, Why do your disciples destroy the traditions of the elders? Why do your disciples teach that um, the law is in you have to obey the commandments. You have to follow the law. Why are they teaching that? They don't wash their hands when they eat bread. Let me read it just as it said. Okay, I, I don't want to. I, I, that was me infer, inferring in today's palang, in today's narrative, what's going on. But let me read it verbatim. According to what the scripture, according to what the gospel says. Why do your disciples disobey the tradition of the elders? Isn't that an interesting question? Let's think about that for a minute. They come to Jesus. From Jerusalem. They left Jerusalem. They're the, the Pharisees, right? They teach the word of God. Paul was a Pharisee. He said it. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was, he was taught under the feet of Gamaliel. He was, he was ahead of everybody in his class, ahead of everybody in his, in his, at his level. He was the cream of the crop. But listen to what, listen to what the question is, people. Listen. They ask Yeshua, why does the disciples disobey the traditions of the elders? <laughs> it didn't say, why does the disciples disobey the commandments of God? It didn't say that. The question is asked, why your disciples don't obey the traditions of of the elders, which points to this interesting truth that in the day and the time of Yeshua, the traditions of the elders were held in a higher esteem to the commandments of God. And now the elders are coming to chastise the eldest. Oh God, I hope you got that. <laughs> and Yeshua, hearing the question and realizing, oh boy, I'm going to hit you all so hard. I'm going to whoop your butt. He answered them. 15, Matthew 15, 5 and 5, 1 and 5, Matthew 15, verse 3 says, He answered them. You know, it's not really polite to answer a question with a question. <laughs> but in this case, think about it. They asked him, why do your disciples disobey the traditions of the elders? He turned back and asked them, why do, you, why do you also disobey the commandment of God because of your tradition? Hmm. Seems like a pertinent question for today. Seems like a fair question for today. That I believe that in the body, within the body of believers, in today's society, 
The majority of the body of believers follow the traditions of the elders, follow the teachings and doctrines of the, the elders and not the commandment of God. Because the elders have so claimed that the commandment of God is now become null and void. Here, we see the commander is rebuking them by asking a question with a question, or by answering a question, by asking a question. Why do you disobey the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And you commanded, whom speak evil of his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, sorry, I read that wrong. Hold on. For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of his father and or mother, let him be put to death. So that's, he was saying that this is the commandment of God. Honor your mother and your father. And if you speak evil of your mother and your father, you should be put to death. That's what God commands. Then he comes back in verse 5 and says, But you say, Whomever may tell his father or his mother, whatever help you might otherwise have gotten from me is a gift devoted to God. Oh, gosh. He is rebuking them. He shall not honor his father or his mother. You have made the commandment of God void. Who has made the commandment of God void? The Pharisees and scribes of the time. The Pharisees and scribes of today's time. They have made the commandment of God void. The Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, the, all those who say the commandment is null and void, all those who disobey the commandment, the Sabbath day commandment, the command not to eat uh, 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 unclean meats, the command to honor your father and mother, the command thou shalt not steal, the command... Uh, uh, um, to to leave your 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 offering at the altar and go make up with your brother. All these things we were taught and we are being taught today. Those things are dis uh, uh, avoided because of what Yeshua did. Here, Yeshua, the Commander, is refuting those things. He's telling them to their face. You are the ones. You are the ones who make it, who made the commandment void by your tradition. And he goes on to call them, you hypocrites. <laughs> well, did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, he goes into the written prophecy. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Again, going back to the ideal, going back to the fundamental principle of God. God looks at the heart. So it's not what you say. It's not only what you say. It's also what you do. And if you say it doesn't line up with what you do, then God literally, he, he will spew you out of his mouth. You must line those two things up. If you do not, you will be misaligned. To be misaligned means to be in sin.
You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching, teaching as doctrine rules made by men. He summoned the multitude and said to them. So he's, he, was, he was rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees or the scribes. And then he summoned the multitude and said to them, hear and understand that which enter into the mouth does not defile the man, but that which proceeds out of the mouth defiles the man. Then his disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees and were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, every plant which my heavenly father did not plant will be uprooted. Listen, leave them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. If the blind guide the blind, both would fall into a pit. Peter answered him, explain this parable to us. Yeshua, we are your disciples. We are your, the people you chose. You called us. Come draw near to us and explain that, what you just said. Explain it to us, please. And Yeshua said, do you also still not understand? Listen, listen, do you also still not understand that when you lie, you cheat, and when you cheat, you steal, and when you steal, you murder, and everything else that God says don't do, you, you do, because you don't understand. He says, do you also still not understand? Don't you understand that whatever goes into the mouth passes into your belly, then out of the body? That's a metaphor. That's a literal explanation of what happens to food that you eat. You eat the food. The body takes in the food. The body digests the food. And what the body absorbs what it needs and the body excretes what it doesn't. Therefore, it's only the excrement that defiles. The excrement is what defilement is. Okay? And then he goes into... And different analogy, excrement comes out one part of the body. Yes? Agreed? He goes into a different part of the body. He says, but the things that proceed out of the mouth, see the excrement is on the other end. But the things that proceed out of the mouth comes out of the heart. And those things defile the man. Right? Remember this principle. God looks at the heart. Remember that. Hold on to that. Run with that. Squeeze it. Hold on to it. He said, verse 19. For out of the heart come 
evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual sin, thefts, false testimony, blasphemies. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile the man. To eat with unwashed hands might be unclean. Could be unclean. You know, could be putting germs in your body and so on and so on. But what he's saying is, your body is built, is designed to deal with those germs. And your body will fight off those germs. And eventually, your body will pass those things out in, you know, the other part, right? Where the, 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 the not the unusable entities come out. And that's defilement, but it doesn't defile you as a person, right? It doesn't separate you from God. No, he goes back to the other end of the body and says, what comes out your mouth, that's what defiles you. Okay? Because what comes out of your mouth comes out of your heart, it comes out within, okay? And out of your heart, listen to what's in your heart in the first place. <laughs> Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual sin, thefts, false testimony, blasphemies, just to name a few. All those things in your heart. And when you speak, if those things are in there, that's what will come out. And those are the things that will defile you. He said murders. We read, thou shalt not murder. He said adulteries. We read, thou shalt not, adul thou shalt not commit adultery. He said sexual sins, which is what adultery is, is one of those. Adultery, fornication, and all the things. He says thefts. <laughs> thou shalt not steal. False testimony, again, you lie, you cheat, you steal, you commit murder, all those, thou shall not, blasphemies, thou shall not, don't speak evil against him, don't, don't do it, remember we talked about that, that's, that's murder, when you, anyone who says to their brother, raka, or anyone who says to their brother, you fool, you, you, you put yourself in a place of judgment. We, we looked at that last week, or week before. Can I remember? Thou shalt not steal. We know, according to the gospel, who, who is the person who wants to steal? The thief. I'm I'm here. I, I don't I didn't come as a thief. I came if I'm thiefing anything, I'm I'm stealing anger away from you. I'm stealing lies away from you. I'm stealing unrighteousness. Deceit and deception. I'm stealing ungodliness. See, David said, Hide my word in your heart. I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. See what I'm saying? David took God's word 
and hide, hid it in his heart so he wouldn't sin against God. I implore us to do the very same. I implore us to understand we must we must no longer live under this world of deception, under this world of lies, under this cheating, stealing, and conniving ideology and philosophy. We must get out from get out from among them and be ye separate. Amen. Thou shalt not steal. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't rob. Don't murder. Okay? We have one more session to do and to close off this series. I pray that you've heard something. I pray that something was said that would cause you to gravitate, take hold of God's word and hide it in your heart. I hope that there was something that was said that caused, that caused you to grab a hold of God's word and caused you to want to, to live by it. I'm going to live by God's word and to declare, as for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. We will serve God. Amen. Hallelujah. And in closing, as we normally do, turning our Bibles to Numbers chapter 6, verse 22 in which we would read a very, a very encouraging, a very uplifting, a very inspirational few words. Um, words that were given to the high priest. And the instructions were for the high priest. To, to declare these words over God's people. If you, sir, ma'am, boy or girl, if you've considered yourself a child of God, then I would definitely ask you to receive these next few words. Amen. Number six. 22 through 27 reads as follows. And Jehovah spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and to his sons saying, this is how you shall bless the children of Israel. You shall tell them, Jehovah bless you and keep you. Jehovah make his face to shine on, upon you and be gracious to you. Jehovah lift up his king countenance towards you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. In the meantime, until next time, Shavuot Tov, Shabbat Shalom, Adios, Buen Nui, Arrivederci, buenos dias, buenos tardes, buenas noches, uh, Tashvedania, uh, deuces, peace, salam, shalom, um, bye, until next time.